All right, welcome to an exciting episode of The Energy That Surrounds Us. I'm your host, Michael. Carla is not going to be joining us tonight as she's not feeling really well. So we wish her well and that she gets some rest. And we look forward to her return next week. And as I mentioned before this, if you saw our post that I did have some announcements... One announcement that I will make is we are live tonight on a new network. We have teamed up with eTalk.tv, so giving a shout out to them. And we are so grateful to be a part of their show. And our other announcement is we are airing our show live tonight on a brand new YouTube channel exclusively for this podcast show so exciting things are coming for the show so keep tuning in and subscribing so you can come along with everything but enough of the boring logistics because we have an awesome guest with us today Catherine Sorolos hi guys good morning from Athens Greece <laughs> it's actually Five o'clock in the morning. Well, we appreciate you getting up <laughs> and coming on our show. I love your shows. I do. I love your shows and I love coming on them. It doesn't matter what time it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's funny because people may recognize you from our old show. And I realized as I was playing the intro, that's the first time you've seen our intro. Yes, I've never seen the intro. This is the first time and I was just like, <laughs> nice, very nice, very nice. Carla put that together with us. I gave her some ideas and she put it together. That is fantastic. That look, that was beautiful. Like it keeps you glued on, and you're like, okay, it just sort of travels your mind, and you're like, okay, and you just get lost in it. So, and then boom, you know, you pop up, and Carla pops up, your guest pops up, and you're like. It's good. This is nice. This is relaxing. Well, I appreciate that, and I'm sure Carla will appreciate hearing that. Yeah. Um, so, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I haven't, I'm not going to see her tonight, but she needs her rest. Yep. Yeah, we always got to take care of ourselves. That's the one exactly. thing we think as hosts and everything that we're like, oh, man, we got to be there. We got to push our way through and it's like no we can take time for ourselves and take care of exactly. ourselves exactly exactly i was like when i was doing my show my greek shows um paranormal shows and i had to travel to the radio station there were times where i didn't know where to leave the kids i had to improvise um i was sick my husband was sick because we're doing the shows together and i was like oh my god i have to be there so, yeah. All right. Well, for those of you who didn't know, Catherine and I were talking a little bit behind stage of what's coming up. And I have to say, Catherine has some really cool and exciting stuff coming up. Do you want to kind of give a little teaser to everyone of what's coming up for okay. you? Well, I'm going to be doing the women's retreat that um, is held with, um, by Jen Jacobs. Um, tickets are on sale on um, if you go into if you go into women's retreat on Facebook, you'll find it. Tickets are on sale there um, for the 25th and 26th of June. Um, I'm going to be doing it virtually from Greece. It is held in Virginia. I'm going to be doing it virtually from Greece for two hours um, each day. Um, it's. It, I, I wish I could be there in person. There's a lot of people saying, oh, are you going to be there? And I'm like, I wish I could. Um, but I'm doing it virtually, so it's exactly the same thing as being there. So it is great. It is women in the paranormal. It is the power of women. Um, we're going to have great psychics there, great mediums um, on 
at the women's retreat, right? They're going to be investigations. It's it's going to be a great weekend, and all these donations, kind of all, the money, all the money is going into um, you know helping the women in aid. It's just it's um, it's going to be helping people. The money goes to some goes to charities. Well, that's really cool. It is, it is, and it's all held and done by Jen Jacobs. And you can find her on Facebook. Um, you can find the Women's Retreat on Facebook. The events are going to be there. There's going to be some great people, Larissa, um, Larissa Rex. Um, actually, I've got a little. If you go on my Facebook or my TikTok, I've got one of the little spots where I've done a little TikTok um, video about it. With all the all the names of all the psychics, medium healers, crystal therapists are going to be there. Very, very cool. Mm -hmm. And I think she holds a, a man's retreat as well. I think she does a men's retreat. I'm not sure, but she does a men's retreat as well. So she does both. That's cool. And so I know you mentioned your radio show has been pushed to the side for yep. uh, it's, reasons. Yeah, it's been pushed on the side because... Um, Hubby uh, is working on the weekends too, so it was hard for me to go and because um, we usually did the shows together. And um, you know, when one's missing, the other one, you know, can't take its place. You know what I mean? Right. It was like how can I explain it? It was just when when we were on the air together, it was magical. It was full of laughter. It was about the paranormal. There were great ideas on it, great talks. But now he's working on the weekends too. So um, that's where I cut it back and I'm not doing it anymore for now. Wow. But um, I've got a lot of people that want me to be doing like paranormal shows um, here in Greece, like radio shows. So I'm talking to a few producers and people that want me on their shows, um, actually doing the show. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. And also I'm doing, um, I'm going to be in a few shows where I'm going to be involved in um, cold cases, like missing people, murdered people. Um, so that came up, that came up a couple of days ago if I want to be on the, uh, on those shows where we talk about the crime and what happened um, with the... With the, with the um, person that's been missing or murdered, um, you know, you're, I'm only given a few details, not even detail, just a photo, and I'm doing like a cold case and remote viewing. So I'm going to ask, how do you process that? Like, how do you face all well, of this? And... Okay. So... Um, <laughs> you can either do it like with psychometry, like if if it's somebody that you, if it's, if they bring me a case that is face to face, like the person that brings me an object of that person that's passed away, and I hold it in my hands, I can I can start feeling what everything about that person, who they are, what they are, what they felt. Um, you know, I go back, I jump back into time, so. I, um, what Heather told you last time, it's like time traveling back in the past. Um, it's, it's called psychometry. It's like metria. Um, psychometry is a Greek word that is cut into two. Psycho is your psyche, is your soul. So you're reading that person's blueprint, that person's soul. Metrio, psychometry, metri, met, comes from the word counting. So, um, metro, that's what the word psychometry, metri is the castle word counting. So it's like you're counting, their, you're actually counting their energy. Oh, that's an interesting way to think about it. I never thought about yeah. it that way. Yep. Yeah. So that's what it is. And they, they either, you can either do it with an object of a person, you can either do it with a photo of a person, um, 
given dates or, you know, just little simple things. And the, the psychic medium taps in and sees the image of the person. Well, this is the way I do it. I tap into the energy and I can see if I, if I don't have a photo of a person and I'm holding an object, I tap in and I start describing what they look like. Uh, there's a There was a case um, where I was helping last year while I was in America about a missing girl. Um, and I could actually see in where she was, how she was hit on the head at the river bank. I could see part of her shoes sticking out of the um, out of the swamp, out of the riverbank, you know what I mean? Because right. it was the water and because it was cold and it was winter, her whole body was covered and I could see part of her shoe and little details on her shoe, like little flowers. And I could see what she was wearing on the day she was murdered. That has got to be hard, though, to, to watch. and mm. It is. I would imagine, can you even let that go, that image? Or no, sometimes you don't. Stick with you? No, it does. It does. Um, Michael, it does. It sticks with you. It does for all your life. Mm -hmm. I had um, a friend of mine, a client, and she's, she was, she's been a client of mine for many, many years. So... Um, it was Ash Monday, um, this is going back in 2011. It was Ash Monday and we celebrate our Ash Mondays here, right? At night time we go, we gather all together, um, we eat, you know, the family, things like that. So um, she rang me. She had put on the show, on a Greek show called um, Light in the Tunnel. Where they they it's a show where uh, they go live and they look for the missing person, and then phone phone calls are coming in um, where the people say, "Yeah, we've seen them, or we haven't seen them, or we've seen them, you know, driving past this this state or this county or whatever." You know what I mean? So that show runs and runs for a few hours, and she she. She wasn't getting anything from that show. So she rang me and she said, I need your help. I said, Maria, that was her name. So Maria, it's 11 o'clock at night. She goes, please, Catherine. She goes, Katerina, that's my name in Greek. Katerina, she's like, please, please, for my kids' sake, please help me. I said, what's going on? She goes, my ex-husband, not even her husband, my ex-husband is missing. They can't find him for three days. Can you, can you tap in? I said, it's 11 o'clock at night, Maria. I've had a few glasses of wine. How am I going to tap in? She goes, please. She was crying. For my she goes, I'm not getting any answers from the show. You know, we're going around in a, in a we're going down um, a rabbit hole from all these people calling and saying different things. I said, give me a few seconds. I said, let me go to a quiet corner. This is all on the phone. Let me go to a quiet corner and um, let me just tap in. I've never met her husband because it was her ex her, sorry, her ex husband. I only knew Maria and um, one of the daughters. So I've brought their faces in my focus because they were linked to the missing person. She was his ex wife, that was his daughter, right? So I just brought their faces in front of me. And now, as I was holding the phone, Michael, like that, at 11 o'clock, 11, 11 30. I was like, Maria, I can I don't feel his heart beat anymore. She goes, What do you mean? He's dead. Um, I can see him behind closed doors. I'm seeing a big building. I'm seeing a lot of police. And I'm seeing lots of people, I said, and people with suits and, and um ties. And it's a big building. And he's he's not he's not alive. He's behind closed doors, but I can see water running, water, water, water running. Um, she goes, I said, well, where was he last time when, when, when he spoke to the kids? Where, where was he going? She goes, he had a court case. I said, 
people should check down at the court, at the, you know, go down to the court and check out what's going on. It was the weekend. Um, so weekend, as Monday, is a public holiday here in Greece. So nothing's open. And um, she was, that's when he was last seen, on Friday at his court case. And I'm like, she goes, but people checked out, um, you know, afternoon there was, you know, somebody went to the court to check out on, on Saturday, but they didn't find anything. But I said, no, she go back to the court, the building, you know, and right. check and try and look further down the stairs, in the toilets. I said, because I'm feeling water run. She was okay. So Tuesday, they couldn't do anything on Monday. So Tuesday, they go back, they go up and down the building. I've got Bri on the phone saying they can't find it, they can't find it. I said, go down the basement. So what had happened, he had gone down the toilet at the basement where not many people go down there. He went in, went to the toilet, was washing his hands, and he had a heart attack. And as he had a heart attack, he left the tap running, he fell back, the door closed, and people couldn't get in. So everybody thought that the door was locked because he was at the back of the door holding it. His, his body was holding the door closed. So oh, wow. people couldn't get in. So they break they broke down the door. He, of course, he started smelling. And that was one of my cases. They found him and buried him. And, and she always says, she always talks about it. She said, if it wasn't for you, you wouldn't have never found him. Yeah, and it's but like, and it's sad time. because it's like in your mind, you can't fault the person who checked and said the door is locked because why would you suspect anything else? It's like, exactly. so it's not like they're covering anything up. It's like, it was just an honest, simple mistake. And it yep. happens. It happens, exactly. And like, you know, you don't, the, apparently the toilet in the basement was was rare, rarely used. Right. So like he, he, went, he went down there. He, <laughs> you know, he went down there. He thought, okay, there's a door open. The toilet I only mean, needs to go he went for a heart attack out. You know, part of me can't help wonder if he knew that was a rare spot and he knew nobody would come and try and do heroic measures because they wouldn't find him. And so he was able to pass on his terms. Exactly. It could have been because um, I think he knew that the heart attack was coming. And the court case was not a very good court case. So, yeah, you, you've got a point there. You, you're tapping in. You're tapping in there. You're tapping in really well. So you've got a great point. Wow. I've always told you you're a great type of medium. <laughs> I know. And it, it hits me at rare moments. Like, I, I don't normally expect it. And it's like. Wow, and it's when it happens, it's like that, that's really cool because it's like, yeah, it's exactly something I never would have thought of. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. Whatever comes in your mind, first thought that comes in your mind, just jot it down and just say, yeah, that's what I'm feeling. That's what I'm feeling. Boom. Yeah, well, Linda Judge just commented hello and she loves seeing you again. Oh, hi. <laughs> it's, good. it's good to see you guys at the other show. So what is going on with Oracle Whispers right now? Because I know you founded them and that's a little separate thing that you do. Yeah. Oracle Whispers is my baby. Um, Oracle Whispers is... Um, my little sanctuary, my office where, um, like, it's, um, yeah, it's my little sanctuary where people come into my office, I do readings, I do past life regression, I do clinical hypnosis, I do crystal therapy, um, I do different 
things when it comes to the paranormal. Do I do cleansings? Um, I go to places where they, they might have um, like private cases of paranormal activity. And I'm all over Instagram, TikTok. I usually do little spots or little videos or where I do readings for people um, remotely or I've got um, things that, you know, star signs or what's going to happen, like astrology spots. So I do a bit of everything. That's what Oracle Whispers is. That's really cool. And I just remembered, like, like you're saying, I'm tapped in is I just got reminded on the past shows that we've had, we've always wanted to talk about a certain subject matter and you're always so excited about it, but we never got to it. And so they're telling me now is the right time to ask it. Okay. The junior team, your work with the junior the team. <laughs> the junior team. So the junior team was made in Alabama. When I was um, when I joined for a little bit the um, Spirit Alabama uh, team, he, uh, um, the leader is Jerry Wilson. So I was while I was staying in Alabama, I was part of that team, and I loved them all. They were great people, and I still love them. And it's like Terry always says, you know, you're always like you're part. You'll always be part of that team. So, um, but, you know, I left, I came back to Greece. So, um, but, like, in spirit, I'm always there. <laughs> so the spirit, the junior team was invented, um, was done was by um, Spirit Alabama, whose leader, like I said, is Terry Wilson. Um, it was my girls and it was... Um, and the girls and the kids from the other team members. And um, we took him on the first investigation in one of the haunted houses in Alabama called Graceland Manor. Nothing to do with Graceland in, um, you know, Elvis's Memphis Graceland, but right. it was called Graceland Manor because the way it was fixed and it was done it was like a clone or identical to the Graceland Manor of Elvis in Memphis. Okay. Same decorations, same carpet, same everything. Like when you walked in, it still had the 1960s style, 1970s style. Wow. Even the wallpaper, even the carpet, the blue carpet, where you would walk in and, and your cold foot would just sink in. And, oh, my God, I'm, I'm jumping back in time here. <laughs> so I had investigated the place, um, so I knew what was going on, what had happened there, and we bought the junior team. So it was like giving my girls, my girls, my two girls were part of the junior team. So it was a first investigation, and I didn't want to take him to a very intense paranormal place or haunted place. Um, not that the, the Graceland Manor wasn't, but it wasn't as bad as some other haunted places that you can go to, like demonic or really right. bad. Like uh, Amityville. <laughs> yeah. No, I wouldn't do that to my kids. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, depends on how talkative they are in the car. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Um, so I took them, took them there. So we... My oldest, Ipoliti, she's an empath, so she gets anxious. So she was walking in and she was like anxious and she was having a panic attack because she was feeling whatever was going. She was jumping back to time, so she was feeling what, what she was picking up. She was tapping in and she was picking up different energies of, of everything, not just, you know, she wasn't just going into one room and picking up that that energy and then blocking it and then going to another room because she doesn't know how to. She's just learning. So I, she's raw, she's still raw. So I let her go in there. I was right behind her. I was right behind every child that walked in and did the tour around the house. 
And like I said, her energy is so raw, like she was just picking up everything. So I had to calm her down and show her the way. Walk into a room, pick it up, you pick whatever's there, you close it down, you go to the next room. The other one, the nine, my youngest one, she sees the dark side of it. So she would walk in, she's more cooler, she would walk in the room, she would be like, yeah, this person was gutted here, and I was like, what do you mean the nine? And she'll be like, yeah, I can see the intestines hanging out and there's blood on the floor. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> she goes, there's a piano here at the piano. There's a, there was a room where they were playing. There was a big piano. Because she goes to me, I can see. She taps in like, you know, in like, you know how you do. She jumps back into time. So she right. goes, I, can see, I can see people dancing. And this guy is playing the piano and... Actually, he's not playing the piano anymore because his head is twisted like that. His 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 uh, hands are twisted. They're broken. There's shots in here. People are dead. There's blood running, and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> enough. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, I didn't put them together on the tour. Each child was touring the place separately. I would have them outside. And I'll take one child and I'll take them around the house and I'll say, okay, what are you, what are you getting? And I'll let them just speak. I've got, I've got that on uh, EMF, on EMF radio, uh, EMF radio, sorry, on a little um, cassette, um, an oh, EMF, you know, EVP, sorry, an EVP recorder. I've got them on EVP recorder, all the conversations and what they're seeing. And um, each child separately. But the stories will connect. So they were tapping into each other. They had great telepathy between them. What I did was I found an old journal after we did the tour and everybody was giving me their, their answers and their answers were very, very similar. Like they were parts of the puzzle put together, um, which that was really good, but which means that the old kids were tapping in, all of them. Even um, Terry's grand, like um, it was actually Terry's granddaughter too, and she was and another little kid, another little girl. They were all getting my daughters, um, Savannah, Terry's granddaughter, another um, little girl. They were all getting the same information. So what I did was I found a journal. I said, "Here, I've got you now." So I found you. I found a journal in place. It was an old journal. We took, we're talking back in the early 1900s. And, I mean, you could do it like that, Michael, and, and it was just breaking, you know, in pieces. That's how old it was. So, yeah, it was very fragile. I had opened it up so I knew exactly what was in the journal. So I, I left it in front of the girls and there was... Um, Ipoliti, the knives, Savannah, uh, Rose, um, another girl, um, she's 16, and another boy that was 15, Dan Daniel, I think Dan, I can't remember the name. So I left him up in front of, in front of him, but it was actually the youngest ones that were getting a lot of stuff, like my girls, Savannah and Rose, the young kids, because the other ones were over 16. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So, they will look at said, Don't touch it, just let me know what you see. Don't open it, don't touch it. So, each child was saying a part of what was a part of the puzzle that was actually putting it all together and was saying parts of what was in that journal. One child, I remember Rose saying the date. Um, and saying that there were uh, flowers in, like flowers, dead flowers, and she, she could see flowers. And then Savannah said uh, another date and she could see photos. Um, my other daughter, she was saying all these dates, she was saying uh, things that they were written in the book. 
so was so was the night. They were all saying exactly the same thing, but putting bits and pieces together. So they they did say that the book was dated in the 1900s. That the person that wrote it um, died in 1970 something. That she was born in um, 1920. 19, oh, sorry, 18 something, 18, I can't remember the dates exactly, um, and died in 1977, so um, 23, 33, 33, 63, 73, so she was, she was born in early, really early, like at the beginning of the 1900s, right, so she started writing the book, which was about 20, the little journal, she was about in her 20s, 8 to 23, and died in 1977. Right. Um, or maybe she was born a bit earlier because the book was dating back, uh, like like I said, it was dating back in the 1800s. I can't remember exactly, but I know that she started writing that book in 1923. So she must have been that age. Um and there were dead flowers in there. There were actually, when you opened up the journal, you could see dead flowers in there. You could see photos in there of um, some young man. Um, her writing was in there of things that she was going through. So the girls were absolutely 100% right of what they were seeing without opening up the journal. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, so they tapped in, they used telepathy and between them. They were tapping into each other. They used telepathy between them and they did remote viewing or they, they jumped into the past and there was read, they were reading exact psychometry. They used psychometry, remote viewing. They used telepathy. So three abilities at the same time, three abilities at the same time. Telepathy, remote viewing, tele um, and uh, psychometry. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah. And when I said before about being the younger they are, their energy is more intense and more raw. The older we get, it, you know, if you don't use it much, it starts at like over 16. Like up to 16, it's very intense for children, their energy. Their gifts, their abilities are very intense up to the age of 16. When you're 16 and over, it's like you start becoming a small adult. So little things are what you've got in your mind, things like I've got to get a car, I've got to get my license, I've got to find this boy, I've got to find this girl, I've got to work, what am I going to do? Am I going to go to uni? Am I going to go to college? So all of a sudden, you're blocking all that at the age of 16. Well, then I think also there's like, you know, when we're walking around, say, on the grounds of a haunted location, and we're like, I smell flowers. Our mind will automatically go, well, I'm sure there's a flower garden around, and we'll dismiss See? it. And yeah, then, <laughs> that could be a very strong clue. Yeah, because you, you debunk when you are when you start getting at the age of, um, so if you don't, practice it and like I did when I was young, I never stopped practicing. I never listened to anybody saying, okay, oh my God, you're seeing things, you might be going crazy or, you know, you don't talk about it. Da, da, da. I took no notice of anybody. I continued and continued and continued, you know, doing all the stuff that I like in the, in the metaphysical and paranormal. But, you know, you've got a lot of parents that can't teach the children or say, you know, they've got blinkers on and they've got what's wrong, don't think about it for society, people are going to look at you funny, da 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 I've got a good example of that by, despite the fact that Greece is Greece, right, and um, the oracle was born in Greece and uh, they used to go to the oracle and that's where I got the oracle whispers from. Um, they, they used to go to Delphi to get, the, the oracle, right, and talk to the oracle to get the the meaning of what the, the, they should do next, right? Like mm -hmm. ancient Greece using the currency. We did a lot of things. Um, now they've got blinkers, 
See, my daughter and I, she's very spiritual. She's learning how to use her roots, her tarot. And she draws, if you see her drawings, Michael, both of my girls are spiritual, but if she's like the youngest, she draws like, for instance, I've got her drawings where she's drawn angels and it's not the angels that we see at church, you know, with the with the sword and the um just the, the two wings and, pre and pretty looking, right? No. Right. She's got them drawn with lots of wings and eyes on the wings. That's the 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 the, 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 the cherubim and the that's the the ones that sit next to the throne of God. Right. It's the seraphim and the powers. Exactly. She's seen that and she brought them to me. She goes, Mom, do angels look like this or like this? I have to look at her and said, the way you drew them, girl. That's what they look like. Yeah. That's the real angels. So she draws in class. She goes in her own little world in class at school. She draws as soon as she, if she doesn't like a subject, <laughs> she takes out a book and she starts drawing. Or she's learning how to do the runes. And she showed her teacher, um, one of the teachers, about the runes. And the, the teacher came up to me. She goes, what are those? I said, she goes, what are those symbols? I said, they're not demonic. I said, relax. Yeah. <laughs> Although <laughs> there are some Viking runes, I admit. They kind of do look it, but they're not. I know. <laughs> and she goes, she goes, oh, um, she goes, they're not showing that she's got these things, these called, they're called runes. I said, I don't know what they're called. <laughs> and she goes, she's better off not talking about that school. I said, why? Why can't she express herself at school? She goes, because ch ch children are funny and parents are funny. When she talks about her, that she sees ghosts and that um, she she tells the kids about haunted places that she's gone to and the kids are funny. As if well, her friends, her friends that she hangs around every day, love it. And they do the same thing. They they talk to her about it. There's haunted locations here in, in the streets that we live. There's abandoned houses. So they go into the abandoned houses and actually my daughter and I show them how to do like um, download applications with um, spirit boxes and things like that. <laughs> Shit. That's funny. So they go to the abandoned places and start with they ask questions. Is anybody here? Can you talk to us? So she's doing her own little thing. She's got like a, a little team, you know, a ghost hunting team. That, that's good, though. I know, I know, and I, I kind of she goes, she said, what about the places? She goes, oh, there's a lot of them around here, Mum, in our streets, you know, in the area that we live, so you've got to show me. But she goes, every time we go there, we, you know, the neighbours come out, don't go there, don't do this. So we sit outside, she goes, and we ask questions to the ghosts in the house. I went, okay, but the teacher actually turned around and said to me, Can she, it's better if she doesn't speak about it at school because kids, I said, her friends are doing exactly the same thing that she does, her good friends. Now, if the other kids are scared of it, I had to tell my daughter, honey, you shouldn't talk about it at school. Don't talk about your rooms. Don't talk about your criminal investigations. Yeah, Don't talk about it. It's the same way here. Yeah. In the 21st century, Michael. We're still 22nd, in the dark the hell ages. We are. Huh? As if we're still in the dark ages. I know. I'm middle ages. Not the dark ages. Well, the dark ages meaning we the middle talk ages, about yeah. this. You're going to be burnt out and stoned <laughs> or something. If I spoke about what I do with everything, I should be burnt at the stake. <laughs> By now. Oh, I, I'm probably not that far behind. Yeah. But um, so the chat group has been, Linda's been chiming in a lot, and I haven't been able to get to them all. So, Linda, I'm giving you your time now. She okay, says, you better, you better tell me the questions because I can't see the chat on the, um, I don't know why I can't see it. Okay, well, she's Linda says, would love to see you taking the tour of Millmount Museum with Jenny 
Sullivan Sanasi, or even Leap Castle. I um, would love to do that. Um, Jenny is a beautiful person. Um, she's a great investigator. Yeah. Um, Emerald Isle, correct? Yeah, Emerald Isle. Emerald Isle. Yeah. She's a great investigator. She's she's um how do I explain it? She loves to animals, she takes she's a foster mummy to animals. Um oh, she's a, man. Yeah. I, I saw her new one and my heart just melted with how cute he is with the two front paws that don't work, but he still tries to move. It's like so adorable. Yeah, yeah, she is so cute. He's called Papaki, which means duck in Greek. That is too funny. So I gave her a shout out. She goes, Tell me some Greek words. So I said, Just some Greek words. And she's going, Papaki, hello. You know, <laughs> Great. Um, but he's he's beautiful, he's adorable, he's so funny, like he smiles all the time, all the time. Yeah, yeah um, I would love to do uh, an investigation with Jen and let Castle and uh, Bill Mount. It'll be amazing. Amazing. I agree. And Linda actually has a really good question here. And Sorry, I didn't get to it in time, but I'm um, getting to it now. Telepathy, remote viewing, and psychometry. Do these gifts feel the same? Yes. Well, that was easy. Yes, because apparently um, remote viewing was used by the Russians and the U.S. and um, the U.S.A. and um, the Germans to they use psychics to remotely find where missiles would be, where bombs would be. So they would give them the um, the um, what's it called in Greek? In Greek, I know what it's called. The codes. It's called the Magnus in Greek, um, um, where. There would be in in which country at exactly which spot. She was she was a a, a, a new Google, you know she was like a Google map that you know when you're remote viewing something especially something like that they were like Google map they would tell them exactly at what spot they were. Right, and then so that's what remote viewing is. Remote viewing to be able to um, remotely. See the diff the little difference is um, remote viewing is where you close your eyes and you visualize the image and where uh, what you're looking for and where exactly it is. Or if you want to help somebody remotely, right? You visualize the person and boom, all of a sudden you're in their place. You're with them and you're helping them remotely. Psychometry um, is when you hold a photo of the person when you feel, hold an object of that person but you're doing exactly the same thing you're tapping remotely into that person right that's the difference one one is withholding photos and objects the other one is just tapping in into the energy without holding or having anything in front of you or any object in front of you I have to say, with all the ways I've ever had that explained to me, that one is like the one that I think will stick in my brain. I'm glad. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it makes total sense. Okay. You know why? Because I've got the, I've got my girls, and I have to explain to them exactly what you know when they ask me questions. I've got to break it down for them, and. And I've learned how to do that like a lot with my kids. So it's it's that way of you're able to explain to somebody else when they ask, them, hey, what's remote viewing? What's telekinesis? What's this? When you start breaking it down without putting the formal words in there that people use, which they shouldn't, you know, right. somebody else can understand perfectly what is going on. Right, and I think Linda's looking for, I think, some guidance by this statement. If I'm wrong, 
feel free to correct me in the chat room. But she says, I often wondered if I was more headed to do oracle work or light trance channeling versus being a medium and communicating with spirits. Okay, let's break it down. Oracle work, uh, oracle, is getting the messages from spirit, from your higher self. Um, the oracle in the olden days, she would sit on the tripod and underneath the, the place she was in, there would be fumes. So she will go into a kind of trance. So there you've got your trance, light trance medium. See how that connects? Yeah. So she would go into a trance so she can give the oracle out. So she can give what the question that they were asking to give their answer. But she would get so docked do out sometimes she would give the backwards answer or she would say something else and, you know, the Greeks had to figure out what the hell she was saying. But <laughs> <laughs> So it is, it is exactly the same thing as being an oracle. You're predicting things that's going to happen. You're going to a trance, the same thing as a light trans medium. And what was the other one? Light trans medium, oracle, spirit. Is that what she asked? And or medium communicating with spirits. Okay, light trans medium. That's you're you're you are a medium. You are communicating with spirits. You are communicating with the other world. A medium, even if you're called a light trans, even if you're called an, an, um, a physical medium, even if you're called uh, just a medium. You're a medium, which means you're in between worlds. You walk amongst many paths. So you have communication with spirit, even if that's the deceased people, even if it's um, entities, even if it's celestial entities, you're open. It's like you're, you're a receiver, non-stop open. Right? You've got the radio open, tuned in, and you're getting information right left to centre. So even if you choose to do light trans or mediumship or oracle, it's exactly the same thing. Okay. It's exactly right. the same thing. The only the only thing that's really hard um, and it's very rare is being a physical medium. Not very rare. You can become a physical medium if you let yourself be open. And a physical medium is when you start letting spirit take over your, over your body and start talking through you. Um, a lot of physical mediums, the voices change when the spirit talks through them. But imagine the thing is, this, being a physical medium, medium takes a toll on your body. I used to do physical mediumship, and now I channel. I, I, I'm always like, Okay, you want to talk to me? I can pass on your message by telling me what you want. And I will tell them exactly. Um, you know, or I, uh, oh, my mind just stopped. She's this black squirrel. Hang on. <laughs> it was like someone pressed the restart button. <laughs> you were talking about physical. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, see, when I, go, when I go into a rant like that, it's like going into a trance. I forget what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have those moments. <laughs> so um, I used to like I do, I used to do physical mediumship, but it takes a toll on your body. Now I do channeling. Like I, I, will, channel the, I will channel the energy. I've done like channeling on a, on a person with the spirit come through and spoken through that person but I left that spirit in that person for five minutes not even because okay. being a physical medium takes a toll on your body it does. and then it does it's like two souls in one body so imagine because this is the truth when a spirit, when another spirit comes into your body your soul needs to move Make to make space, and so do your organs inside. So uh, that's why a lot of people that do physical mediumship are 
like have you seen all these um, colored people that go to churches, do the gospel, and a lot of them do the mediumship, the physical mediumship, where spirit comes through and talks to them, talks through them. They're all big people. Right. So because why? Because your body needs to make space for another soul to come through. You know, it's interesting you, you put it that way because I was being brought up in the metaphysical world. I was always told, I was always like, you know, why does my body always feel like it's bigger, heavier than it needs to be? And they would say because it needs to contain the energy. Exactly. That is exactly right. That's why I'm not, I'm not, I'm no skinny. You know what I mean? I've, right. got, I've got to con exactly. I've got to contain the energy as well, and they were absolutely right by telling you that your body needs to contain the energy. Your body needs to contain the spirit, um, and whatever's coming through your body. So that's what. I, but it does take a toll on your body because your intestines do move inside, and a lot of people that do physical mediumship because, like I said, there's a lot of people out there. Not it's rare. But there's a few people out there that do mediumship. Um, they actually do it, like physical mediumship. And um, there's a lot of them that have passed away at an early age, like in their 50s. And your body hurts. Your organs, your in, in, internal organs actually hurt. It's like having a baby every day. And it's growing from zero to nine months. And then you're giving birth to it. Can you imagine what happens to your organs before pregnant? Mummies that have had babies know what happens to our organs before pregnant. But imagine doing that every day as a physical medium or once a week or wow. twice a week. So I think I actually did do physical mediumship once when I was channeling because... There was, in the group I was with, I I knew my voice altered because mm -hmm. people had told me that, which is really hard to do consistently. If you've ever tried that, it is really hard. So you can't fake that. But no. she commented that my eyes physically changed. They were not my eyes. And I was like... I always thought that was cool, and I just thought Spirit just did that to show to her, yes, we are somebody else. We're not one person here. I never thought of it being a physical medium moment. Exactly. That's what it is. It's a physical medium. She, the Spirit came through and started talking through you, became one. You know what I mean? And your body fights it back, you know, to, hey, you don't belong here. What are you doing? You know what I mean? But then you, that's when it starts, you know, when spirit comes through without you acknowledging it or without saying, yep, yeah, you take over my body. But, yeah, then your eyes change, your voice can change, your whole body shape can change. Your, I had, I had um, oh, my God, I don't have it on video, but in one way investigations when I was in, um, in America last year in March, we did an investigation with a team an event at the YMCA and um, I was a guest there and um, as a psychic as a psychic trans medium so down at the basement I could feel um, at the YMCA I could feel a, a woman there that was chained up she was used to you know for men to do the work the dirty work um, they will only give her a little bit to eat, so she was really skinny and scrawny, and she was going, she was going crazy. She would laugh, she would cry. She just wanted somebody to talk to. And so when I went down to the basement, all I could hear was chitter chatter. You know, I'm like, okay, who are you? What do you, what do you want? You know what I mean? So as, as I looked down the basement, she was. Sometimes I would see her chained up, or sometimes I could see her in a straight jacket so they were doing some filming down at the basement so i said to one of the cameramen rex i said to him why don't we because i was down there with candy slater and um 
Derek Slater as well. They're both incredible investigators. Um, and uh, Derek is a, an incredible psychic trans medium. Um, Candy is really great with uh, her historical, uh, historical part of things as a researcher, as an investigator, and a Reiki master. So fantastic people. So um, I was down there and I asked Candy, she goes, oh, she goes, you can hear that woman too. I said, yeah, I can. And she goes, I'm, I said, don't tell me anything. You've done your research. You know what's going on here. Don't tell me anything. Let's see what comes through this. So we did, uh, re, um, what's it called? Um, a reserve of doing it, of repeating history. What's that word? Help me out here. Um, a reenactment. That's it, yeah. Yep. So I had one of the guests chained up in a straight jacket because somebody had bought a straight jacket. <laughs> so I had the guest chained up, like, you know, in, in handcuffs. And um, not, I had the yeah, one I did had cuffs and the other one I put in the straight jacket. So the, ones, the one that was in the handcuffs, that's the one I channeled a lot of energy through. So she was in her handcuffs. And as I was channeling energy, I was bringing the spirit down and the spirit came to the world. So her voice started changing and actually got it on camera. Michael, her whole face changed. It altered. You know, her jawline, the cheekbones, they went like she was a girl who had cheeks, right? She had dark hair. She had, you know, big cheeks. Really, you know, a bit chubby here, and all of a sudden you can see her cheeks just going hollowed, all hollow in. Her eyes going really hollowed, her jawline changing completely, and and I was just like, everybody, the guests there and the guests upstairs that were watching all this from the monitor, I'm like, oh my god, oh my god, and um, she's like. I was, she was, I was talking and I was channeling them energy and I was asking her questions so the spirit was answering back and then I could feel, I could tap in and feel that she wasn't very well. And I could see um, the, the, the spirit that she was pregnant and she had lost the baby in them. So all of a sudden, out of, you know, while we were doing the channeling and, and spirit was talking to us, the girl sort of turns around and says, I'm not feeling well. I'm feeling this warm, liquid, like blood coming down my thighs. She was actually relieving the part where that spirit woman had lost the baby while chained up. Wow. So I said, Bryce, bring her down straight away. Let's go. I grabbed her and went to her upstairs and did some rapey on her because guests and the teammates come first. Right. And then the investigation. So I made sure that she was okay and then we continued on the investigation. Right. So we're actually at our hour, but there's a few more questions in the chat group. Are you okay. free to... Answer. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, go right ahead. All right. Well, ironically, to switch things to a lighter mode, um, Linda asked earlier when we were talking about the runes, she says, are there Viking runes in Greece? Uh, no. Um, you can buy them. Um, but... Yeah, you can buy them. It, um, it doesn't matter what divination tools somebody would use. Like, I, I can't do runes, right? I can do tarot, I can do um, the, the pendulum, I can do different other things, but I can't do runes. My daughter's good at runes. So everything like that, tarot decks, pendulums, runes, the ching, I ching, whatever it's called, they're all divination tools for the side of me. So, yeah, um, those runes were actually um, drawn. I do, I, I've got a teacher, he's a shaman, so I'm doing my shaman journeys to become a shaman, so, like, shamanism. So um, he drew the runes for her, blessed them for her, and gave them to her. 
he actually mm. brought brought little little stones from Norway. I honestly would have thought there would be runes in Greece because we have runes here in America. Yeah, we do have runes. You can go buy the runes. You can, but these were handmade. Right. Oh, I, I, and the, and yeah. the stones were and the stones are from the place where the where the runes were born, where the, um, the history of runes was born in Norway. Right. Yeah, and I, I was also meaning like places where the Vikings actually left their runic language on the land. Is I was thinking, yeah, I'm sure they're in Greece because we have places like the middle of the United States where it wasn't found until like quote unquote the 1800s but there's Viking runes in there that are dating back before that and so it's like yeah our history here is a little confused <laughs> it is yeah because I mean in Greece you've got your, your oracle where they used to go to Delphi and get their um, and speak to the oracle to get their answers. Right. And talking about the Oracle, there is one thing I've always found that in the back of my mind, I always questioned the Oracle is because they never let the person speak directly to the Oracle. They always had to have the quote priest who had to yes. translate and say, this is what she said. Yeah. And I'm like, that's an awful lot of power to put on somebody because if he's like, I don't like you, he could say whatever he wants and says, that's what the Oracle said, and they'll believe him. Well, no, actually, I don't, um, no, they wouldn't do that because they were sworn to Apollo. So if they lied, they were scared of the gods' wrath, you know? Well, that's um, good to know because I always thought, it's like, you know, somebody was like, yeah, you're a bad leader. Yes, go to war. We're in favor of the war. And the Oracle's like, no, you're going to die. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> but the, the Oracle would say things backwards or would say things metaphorically because she would, I don't know what the hell she was smoking. She was smoking something <laughs> Methane gas is what they think from. Uh, yeah, and she was actually chewing on bay leaves. Bay leaves um, is uh, it's like a psychotropic kind of, um, you know, if you start eating them or, you know, burning them, you, you go into a, a light trance, you know what I mean? Right. So that's what they used to say, that she used to chew on, on bay leaves. Um, but I think it's the whatever fumes were coming out from underneath the earth and she would go into a trance. And she yeah. would, she even, she said to them, it was at the Mr. Police, she said that you need to hide behind wooden walls with the war in um, Athens in, in, in um, not the Thermopyl, Ellipsis, that, that war, that, the war that was on, um, no, Salamis, the, the, the yeah. Okay. I'm trying to remember my history here. So what they did, the the Athenians, they built a wooden wall in Athens, so Xerxes could not, the Persians could not invade. Right. But what what the um, oracle really meant is hide behind your ships, your wooden ships. Fight with your wooden ships. They yeah. built another wall. Yeah, but we did win the war again. <laughs> I will say, as far as like historical accuracy and everything, I feel like the movie 300 really portrayed the Oracle going in the trance really well and like yes. the movements and everything, and how they would inter and you know, maybe not necessarily how the priests interpreted it. But her role, I was like, yeah, they were secluded. They were yep. kept away from everything. It was a journey to get to the Oracle. Mm -hmm. So I think that was like one of the major points of that movie that I was like, I was really impressed by it. Because I was like, yeah, that's really what it was like for the Oracle. Yep. 
Yeah, that's true. That's how it really was. That's how it was. That's how it really was. Yeah. So, yeah, and apparently there were virgins that were not supposed to be touched by men. So right. they had to be pure. And they were taken at a early age, selected out. Yes. Yep. All right. So it was it was a hard job being an oracle. Which leads us to Linda's next question, which <laughs> it's kind of funny because we're going from or we're jumping around topic wise because <laughs> we're getting caught up. But she asked, "What's the easiest way to raise your energy and frequency level?" Oh, okay. Um, you can do it through meditation. You can do it by doing um, like chanting. You know, have the, the priests in Tibet do the chanting, like om, like really lifting up your energy by chanting um, and uh, listening to frequencies of hertz, like different hertz um, frequencies, frequencies. So you can lift up the frequency at that point. You need to raise the energy. So you can do it by praying, you can do it through chanting, you can do it through meditation. Um, you can do it by listening to um, different herds. So, yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, sorry, I'm trying to, I'm seeing something and I'm trying to think. She says, wow, Bailey's, but can't the oracle work be done without an additive? I think, if I'm not mistaken, the Bailey's was kind of, I think, more like just ritual. They, I don't, I don't yeah. think you have to do the Bailey's. I think No, you don't have to do the Bailey's. It's like a and ritual no, of what I they thought. I don't chew on Bailey's every day <laughs> at all. I put him in my lentil soup. Um, but yeah, I, I do like a lot of bay leaves. We, bay, bay leaves and greens is a big thing. So we cook all, a lot of our sauces, our red sauces, a lot of us, um, like lentil soup. We do put a lot of bay leaves. It doesn't, it just, it breaks away the, the smell of whatever you're cooking. That's what bay leaves do. No, but yeah, you can do it without bay leaves. You don't need to take anything. No magic mushrooms, no bay leaves, no psychotropics, no licking any frogs. You can just go into a trance just like that. She says, I'll start eating lentil soup with bay leaves. Lots of laughs. <laughs> you, you can. I find so a lot of things in history, like Linda made the comment, getting firsthand you know, is really cool with history is you and I both know, you know, we both have studied the histories and the, the mythos behind it. And it's always interesting how there's little tidbits of what is real and we feel like we have to embellish to sell and make it sound better. And it's like, no, the little known fact, like, you know, the, like, the Thermopylae battle, you know, they stood up yeah. and said, you know, enough. And yeah, they won on the na with the Navy, which was unexpected. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, you know, oh my gosh, you know, everybody joined. No, it was a few people actually in there's so many times in history where few people from the culture stand up say enough is enough exactly and causes change we exactly. always think we have to have the majority the masses to make change and it's like no you just need that little spark yep that's true that absolutely that is absolutely true but i will say though you do get a better movie when you have more than just a few people. <laughs> you do. But you know what? There was only 300 of them. There were. 299 plus 300 with Leonidas. There you go. 
Right. That's right. And there were 10,000 10, yep, 10, Persians. 10,000 Persians at the Thermopylae. And yeah. 300 Spartans. And I will say, as much as, you know, the Spartans come off as arrogant and like the masters of the land and everything that actually is who they were it's like exactly you see like the athenians or the macedonians or you know mm -hmm. the other cultures coming in and saying you only sent 300 and he's like well what's your profession he goes well i'm an artisan what's your profession i'm a poet Exactly. Spartans, what's your profession? And they just yell out a battle cry. It's like, yeah, that exactly because hundred of them is worth like four thousand of you. <laughs> exactly. They were trained. They would take the children from the mothers from the age of seven. They were trained from the age of seven. The child, the boy, will be taken away from its mother from the age of seven to be trained, and they they would like. Trained for 365 days a year, and even we, women <clears throat> were not. You know, women were trained. They were hardworking women, the Spartan women. Oh yeah. They would be out in the fields. They would help the husbands with the war. They would, you know, they would be behind their husbands, um, pushing them to do things. And they were the ones. Those mothers were the ones that actually would, if the babies were deformed. They will throw them off the cliff. Right. It's Tartarus. And if I'm not mistaken, isn't the Spartans like the only true matriarchal clan yes. of Greece? Yes. Yes. And I think that's the one thing they never understood. Like when they would bring in their messengers, or like the Athenian messengers, they'd always go, Where's your king? And they're like, the queen would be standing there like, why do you need the king? Exactly. You'll talk to me. <laughs> yeah, no, it was it was a matriarch um, city. It was. But it was. I often wonder, though, that one scene in the movie where the messenger is there and he insults the queen... And so he ends up kicking them down this well that, like, seems to go forever. Yep. I, you know, I often wonder, I was like, how real is that? Did they really, would they really go to those lengths if you upset the, the females, like, talk down to the females? Would they really? Yep, they would. They would like I said, if the child was born with a deformity, they would throw them. They either the, the mother will grab a child and throw it off the cliff of Kaavas. Kaavas is the mountain that they would actually throw. They wish to say they would throw, throw them in the Tartarus, but it's Kaava. Kaava is the mountain, Sparta, in Sparta, Sparta, in Sparta, where they would throw the deformed children. The only one that they didn't they didn't throw was Ephialbi, the one that betrayed King Leonidas. Um, right. his mother hit him away. The deformed, yeah, the one right. that betrayed King Leonidas, which is written in all history books, all great history books. And, you know, I will say, as far as history goes, um, before I mention that, Linda brought up a good, uh, interesting thing of, she says, that's new to me. Being matriarchal was never pointed out when studying Greek history in grade school. They don't, actually. They don't. They don't. But that's how it was. And let me tell you a little thing. Um, when they would get married, I learned that in ancient Greek history in Australia, in ancient history, I did Greece as well. So I did Rome, I did Egypt, and I did Greece. They would dress... They, they would get married, the Spartans would get married, and they would dress their women on the night of, of the first night of um, the marriage. They would dress the, the women as their um, as soldiers. They would put an army thing on them and dress them up as 
soldier. Right. And have made love to their wives because it would rem because they would spend 365 days in campus with men. So all they all they saw was men, 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 men. So they would dress um, their women as men on the night of the of the wedding, the wedding night. Um, I think it was meta I think it's metaphorically as well. It's got to do with power. Right. Because yeah. Sparta was also, if I'm not mistaken, if the man and woman got married and say it was arranged, and the woman was like, I'm not having this, she was totally had all the power to say, Nope, we're not married anymore. You have to get yeah. out, you're homeless, and she gets everything. Yeah, 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 that would happen. Yep. So it was like, it's yeah. True. It was like, it's, it's true. It's a true part of history, yes. But so one thing I will say about the 300 movies, the second movie kind of threw me for a curve <clears throat> because everything I read about Sparta was like, you know, the land wars, you know, and I knew they were the best soldiers on land. But I did not know they were the best Navy. I was always taught the Athenians had the most powerful Navy, the best ships. But it was like the movie 300. I don't know if it's because they were embellishing Sparta and trying to show off Sparta. But you're right. Um, coming no, in, like, <clears throat> you're what? right. Um, <laughs> the best Navy. It was the, the best um, navigators and the best navy. It was the Athenians. They had the best navy. The Spartans were men of war and um, on foot, right? The Athenians were the ones that were always at sea. Yeah, because it threw me off when the, the Spartan navy arrived, and I was like, there's a Spartan navy? No, oh, that's Hollywood. Kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's ho it's Hollywood. <laughs> I, I kind of thought that because I was like, <laughs> when did men who were off training for war build ships? <laughs> no, they never did. No, they might have, but not not to that extreme. But no, because Sparta is land. There's land around it. There's no sea around. Um, right. It's not like uh, Athens. Athens is surrounded by like, around with sea, with the Aegean Sea. Yeah, but at the same token, though, I kind of feel like if they had a navy, they probably would be supreme at it because yeah. that's their focus and mentality of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was like war, war, war. You know how you give a little dog. A ball and it's like ball, ball, ball. That's how the Spartan ones ball, 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 training ball. That's it. Yeah. But yeah, and I, I love how in reading history, it's like, like you were saying, there were 10,000, maybe 30,000 Persians coming through. And all of a sudden, by the time it gets to our age, it's there was like a million Persians and only 300 <laughs> Spartans. And I'm like, the earth shook. I'm like, yeah, I'm sure the earth shook under the 10, 30,000 people that were marching. But Persian, no way, had an army of a million people. <laughs> no, they didn't. <laughs> it's like, if they showed up with that, the whole world would be Persian. There would be exactly, no exactly. There's a, a, there's a mountain here in Athens. It's called the Mount of Egalo. It's where Xerxes, the Persian king, would sit, sat on his throne on that mountain. It's right here in Athens. That's where my husband's from, uh, Egalo. So the mountain is right, right there. The Mount, Mount um, Egalo, that's what it's called. <clears throat> So, they, uh, so Xerxes, the king, the Persian king, will sit on his throne on there and watch the war of the Battle of Sin from Salamis, Salamina and, um, and Elefsina, the two, uh, what the two uh, battlefields that were done 
on water. So he will sit there and watch the battlefield. And to his great disappointment, you now the Persians were all gone, drowned. <laughs> right. So, yeah. But and he would sit on that mountain and actually watch it from afar. Yeah, and there's a little known battle that I've read about that I feel like if it wasn't for the strategy of the Athenian Navy would have changed the whole outcome, and that was the Battle of Marathon. I really Marathon. think the Persians yeah. would have taken the field if That's the true. Navy had survived. But when they watched the Navy being crushed, you know those troops on the land had to sit there and go, oh, crap, we're yeah. now alone cut off in enemy territory <laughs> with no supplies. This is not good. And you exactly. know they probably were like, the Greeks were like, all right, we now finally have the upper hand. <laughs> True. <laughs> True. No, those were great battles. And actually, if you ever come to Greece, you'll see the statues that we have or of our heroes, the ancient Greek heroes, and each um, it's like a gate, a gate or a gateway. Uh, as soon as you enter the city of Thermopolis, of Marathona, of um, Salamina, of Ellipsis, we've got statues there of our Greek heroes just standing and little things of what happened and how it happened. Um, labels. Yep. So Linda says, every time you're on, Catherine, I'm always amazed. Bless you and lots of loves. Thank you. <laughs> and she had to say goodbye because it's late. Yep. So hello, Howard. He's our, He now runs our network. So hello, Howard. Just having a fun chat about history and all things Greek, apparently, now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yep. Which you can't ask for a better source to, you know, get the truth on. From a Greek. <laughs> but so oh Howard's pointing out that um if in October, the last weekend of October, I believe it's the 26th, 27th, 28th. Yep. Wanna to come to New Orleans? We are doing a fear fest. It's going to be a huge paranormal event that we're putting on. So definitely you can get tickets, I believe, at fearfest.com is the website. If I'm wrong, okay. correct me, Howard. And looking forward to that event. And so, yeah, we're uh, approaching, wow, an hour and a half. Yeah. Uh, do you have any other big events coming up? Like no, no big events, nothing. Um, like I said, the one I was going to do was for the women's retreat. I could, I wish I could fly over and be there. Like there's a lot of people that would have liked me to be there, but uh, I wish I was there as well. But it's a bit hard to fly over there now at the moment financially. But um, maybe I should take you up on that New Orleans one. I I, I always like to visit New Orleans, so maybe I should. You up on that, so no big events like physically being there, only doing like a lot of podcasts, like the missing people's, um, um, and cold cases. That's about it, awesome. and my oracle stuff. <laughs> well, we'll definitely send you information about, yes, please, New Orleans, and yes, please. <laughs> So once again, just, you know, letting everyone know, you know, we are so, so proud to be a part of the Paranormal United Network and Parapost. They're hosting the Fear Fest 2023. So come check it out and you'll probably get to meet most of, if not all of the hosts on the network. I believe we're all coming to check it out. But yeah, um, 
So you mentioned being on TikTok. Where else can everyone find you if they have they any questions? Find, okay, they can find me on TikTok as Oracle Whispers. I've got two. I've got Oracle Whispers and I've got Catherine Surreals as well. So either one. But mostly I usually do put all the events and everything on Oracle Whispers. Uh, they can find me on my Facebook page um, called Oracle Whispers by Catherine Surreals. And even if you put Oracle Whispers on um, on Google, it comes up Oracle Whispers in Greece, Oracle Whispers in Scotland. Like it comes up, I'm everywhere <laughs> apparently. <laughs> That's not a bad place to be. Uh, no, I mean I had a client call me because um, why does your phone say Oracle Whispers when somebody calls you? Pops up as Oracle whispers on my on the phone and i said um because that's how google has made it out that oracle whispers it's like really imprinted out there you know because because i'm looking for catherine I, i'm like yeah i am catherine but it says oracle whispers and i'm like yeah i'm oracle whispers too <laughs> catherine so, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the one with many names. So, um, Oracle Whispers by Catherine Surreal's Facebook, TikTok, um, Instagram, Oracle Whispers, on um, Twitter, um, Oracle Whispers. You can find me anyway. Or if you just don't want me as Oracle Whispers, you can just put on Catherine Surreal's and you'll find me. All right. Well, okay. thank you again for coming, and thank you to everyone in the chat room. And, Linda, thank you for your. Yes, awesome questions. <laughs> and thank you for having me. Thank you for having me again. I, I loved. I enjoyed. Like time flies so fast with you guys. It does. It does. It does. And it's fun. It's actually fun. It is, and I will say the only thing, personally, is I wish we didn't have to get you up at five a.m. to come on the <laughs> show. <laughs> I always feel a little bad because I'm like. Yeah, we're kind of robbing you of sleep time. That's okay. That's okay. No, I'm going to go to bed earlier tonight, so it's okay. <laughs> well, That's as good. always, we're happy you're on our show and that you're a guest that keeps coming back and mm -hmm. sharing your adventures with us. I'm glad. I'm glad I can, you know, come onto your show. So, and and I'm, I'm glad... Um, I can have these conversations and um, it's like just sitting on a table and having a cup of coffee and just talking to a good friend. That's how that's how nice it is. That's how good it is. Well, I'm glad it, you know, that's what we strive for. So I'm glad it's coming across. Good, good. Great. It was good right. seeing you again. Yeah, it's good seeing you too. And I am. Um, as the host, going to shamelessly plug that if you enjoyed Catherine tonight, she is actually going to be on my other paranormal show with Kel Ridley called Paranormal Versus on April 13th. So be sure to, you know, you can catch her there as well. And we'll be sharing more stories and. Yep. Probably be having more fun conversations about history. So <laughs> yeah. Stay tuned and mm -hmm. tune in for that if you're interested. So awesome. I won't keep you anymore because I know you got things to get to in the it's morning time. So yeah, the, the girls will be up very soon. You know, <laughs> breakfast. Um, getting ready for school. Ah, the fun life. I know, of being a mum. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. It was great. Thank you, guys. Good night. Thank you. To, good, night. good night to you guys. Good morning to us. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. All right. And so, as I mentioned, we are now on the Paranormal United Network. Parapost Central Network. And we are also now on eTalk.tv. 
So thank you all for coming and sharing this great adventure with us. Have a blessed night. And next week, we have Preston Dennett coming on our show. And Carla will be back, hopefully. So blessings to you all. And if you're going investigating this weekend, as always, be safe and have fun. Good night, everyone.